On planet Doug, we've made a stop at the historic town of Gambang Phet, which is in the province of Gambang Phet here in Thailand. And when I come to a historic town, I always like to go to the museum first, if they have one. I think of it a little bit like sending up a drone where you get an aerial view of the city to get the lay of the land. I come to the museum to get a historical aerial view of what is going on. So I'm just outside the uh, gates to the Gampang Fed National Museum. Haven't gone inside yet, and I just wanted to give an idea of the hours of this place. Here's the sign at the entranceway, the Gampang Fed National Museum. And I was quite lucky with my timing by accident because today just happens to be a Sunday, and it is open on Wednesday to Sunday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., closed on Monday and Tuesday and national holidays, admission fee 100 baht. So as you can see, it's very nicely landscaped here, beautiful entryway. So I have uh, high hopes for the museum. Hopefully they let me bring my uh, camera inside and uh, keep talking about all the things I'm going to be learning. So uh, yeah, let's go inside and learn a bit. I don't know much about the Sukhothai kingdom, except that I believe it is considered to be the first official original kingdom of Siam and modern-day Thailand and followed of course by the Ayutthaya kingdom and the Sukhothai kingdom lasted for 200 years from 1238 until 1438 so all of the ruins and the artifacts and the city walls that you see here date back as much as 600 to uh, 800 years Quite impressive, quite excited about uh, going inside now. And I've been walking around the grounds outside and it's been quite interesting. They actually have a number of exhibits on the outside, such as these two elephants over there, a singa, a lion over there, a, a stupa replica over there. I guess the top part is uh, original. And then here are the grounds outside the museum. And there's quite an interesting structure right here. I haven't taken a closer look at that yet. We'll find out uh, what that is. One thing I've noticed already is that a lot of the artifacts here, these statues, they don't actually date all the way back to the Sukhothai kingdom from 1238 to 1438. These are from the much later Ayutthaya kingdom. So these are dated from the, between the 16th and 17th centuries. So that's something to keep in mind. I, I guess I had it in my head that since I'm in Kambang Fet and it's associated with Sukhothai, that the historical town here, the historical park, would be associated with the Sukhothai kingdom. And perhaps some of it is, but a lot of it is also uh, much more modern than that from the 16th and 17th centuries of the Ayutthaya kingdom. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, there it is uh, there. I'm quite excited. I find museums are so civilized. I love visiting them because I just feel good when I go there. They're generally... I've heard that this one is uh, very air-conditioned, almost like a refrigerator inside, and that makes this uh, Canadian very happy. I'm still outside the museum itself, the main exhibit hall behind me there just exploring the grounds. I love a museum that has exhibits on the outside. 
that feeds into my usual pattern of wanting to stay on the outside for as long as possible before going into the uh, interior. So I've had a really good time just exploring the grounds. And there's another uh, ruin here of the Wat Samangan. There's the sign for this, the Wat Samangan. There are two parts to it. There's that section over there at the front, and then there's a raised platform right here leading up to some kind of a uh, shrine or altar there. And the sign reads, uh, this is the deserted temple Wat Samanam with remaining base of stupa, base of Ubosatha, the ordination hall, and water wall, Ayutthaya style, circa 16th to 17th century AD. But all built out of laterite, as you can see, and then there are a number of uh, Buddha images there. Some made from laterite. You can see that they're worn quite a bit more than uh, some of the others, perhaps. I don't know if all of them were made from laterite or just some of them. And there's another uh, display over here, a wall with some cannon. I find that interesting. So let's go take a look at that. The cannons that caught my eye brass can no oh, bronze bronze cannons according to the sign at the front built into a laterite wall which i've seen on other signs they're calling sandstone i don't know if laterite and sandstone are different or the same but as you can see these also are ayuta ayutaya style circa 16th 17th century found near a bridge Gambang Fet Ancient Town. They have two cannon here, and then uh, two more on a base over there. And what could this be? A part of a laterite toilet used in a temple. Ayotia. Found during excavation of Wat Awat Yai, outside the town walls. So there you have it. Even the Toilets were made from uh, laterite, very useful stone. You can carve it into any shape you like. Okay, that might be enough wandering around the outside, even for me. Look at the size of this place. There could be a lot in there to uh, check out. So let's go in. Beautiful day for my museum visit. I'm very appreciative of that. I've paid my entrance fee to come in. It was 100 baht, as I expected. And one thing about museums in general I've learned is that they sometimes have rules that you have to leave your bag at the front. So before I go into a museum, here's a planet dug tip, what I do is arrange everything beforehand. So I put my camera in my pocket, I put memory cards in my pocket, extra batteries in my pocket, my phone, everything I might need in the museum I put in my pocket just in case they ask me to leave my bag at the front desk. So I did get all prepared and they had a sign at the front saying that your bags must be left at the information desk, but they didn't ask for it. I even showed them the bag and indicated, like, do you want me to leave it here? And they just waved me through. So I did prepare, but I didn't actually need to, but it's a good idea to think ahead that way. And cameras can be sensitive, so I generally put my camera away as I go into the museum. And then I take it out once I'm inside. And then they can tell me to put it away if that's the rule. But there's no sense walking right into the entrance with a giant camera. That can make them, trigger them to tell you, oh, you know, no cameras allowed. But at the entranceway, they have um, a couple of wonderful documents. Here's one. A, a big map of the area for free, Kampang Fet, and it's a map of the whole region with all of the historical sites marked on it with long descriptions in English. I'm very excited to get that. And they have a brochure in Thai and in English all about the museum itself, giving you the hours. And apparently this uh, museum was... Uh, Big building began in 1967 and it was officially opened on March 19th, 1971. 
and it originally consisted of one building and then over time three more buildings have been added with corridors linking them. So now they have three main exhibits. So um, I'm still at the entrance. I haven't even gone into exhibition hall number one yet. I'm about to do that. So what I can tell, exhibition hall one is dedicated to um, ancient history, prehistoric times to um, historic periods. Exhibition hall two, uh, more modern, like Ayutthaya and Ratanakosin periods. And exhibition three is more present day and dedicated to the various uh, ethnic groups of uh, Thailand. And this is the uh, interior of exhibition hall number one. And I finally found the mythical, intense air conditioning of the Gambang Fet uh, National Museum. It's right here. You can probably hear the air conditioners running. It's a powerful set of them. And it's ice cold in here. And uh, I'm very happy about that. So far, I'm enjoying myself immensely inside this museum. I love a museum that helps you feel smart. And the best way to do that is to take all the items that are on display and put them in context. And I'm sure I'll forget everything 10 minutes after I head out the door. But for now, I'm starting to feel very intelligent. For example, I love this sign here right at the very beginning, which gives you all the different ways that they date objects. And they have it laid out really nicely here. I'm really impressed with this display. For example, I mean, they're calling it, you know, dating cultural periods in Thailand. And there's different ways that they do it. And here at the beginning, they're dating it based on inventions and industry. So you've got the Stone Age, from 500,000 years to 8,000 BC, the Middle Stone Age, the New Stone Age, Bronze Age, and then the Iron Age, which of course, it's pretty clear, Stone Age, you're dealing with very rough and crude stone tools, the Middle Stone Age, a little bit more refined, uh, the Middle Stone Age, the New Stone Age, you're starting to get sharp edges and more um, interesting design, and then of course, Bronze Age, they discovered bronze material and then iron. So that's one way to define all of the periods of history. But you could also date it based on way of life for the people. Beginning, of course, with hunter-gathering, 500,000 years ago to 2500 BC, then an agricultural way of life, and then urban society living in large communities. And then finally, we've got the geologic time scale, you know, the Pleistocene epoch, the Holocene epoch, things that go back millions of years. So I read through this whole thing, and at the end of it, I felt uh, very smart. And I had my usual amusing thoughts, like, can you imagine some, someone who's born into the Stone Age, and all he gets to use is rocks? And he's like, oh, for Pete's sake, I was born into the Stone Age. You know, why couldn't I have been born in the uh, era of uh, the iPhone? If he knew the iPhone was ever coming. Or, failing that, you know, the period of writing. Because there was always a period in society when writing was invented. And they say that writing in Thailand is evidence from a thousand years ago to the present. The museum is continuing to make me feel smart, which I really appreciate. The next room is dedicated to the series of kingdoms that existed on this land, starting with the earliest, working its way up until Sukhothai and Ayutthaya. And I have to say this one, I think I've seen the name before, but today it feels completely brand new as if I've never heard of it. So predating all of these was the kingdom of, I don't know how to say that, DV, Dvaravati, Dvaravati, a territorial empire located in Southeast Asia between 
present-day Myanmar and Cambodia. So we've got this kingdom, the Dvaravati. Looks like very culturally advanced with a lot of art dedicated mainly to uh, religious ideas. And they have a lot of displays here about the art and architecture of the Dvaravati culture and their communities. This I really like. This is my favorite thing here, the uh, terracotta lamp. Very clever to be able to uh, make a lamp like that with a wick on one side and then a reservoir for oil on the other. And then we move on to the Lopbury Kingdom. Right there. And the town of Kambang Fet itself may date from the Lopbury Kingdom, actually. And there's a lot of information about the Lopbury Kingdom, the sculpture and the culture. And then finally, not finally, but then we come to Sukhothai with some more specific information about where we are now. Um, so here's a display all about the importance of the Ping River, which I find really interesting. And here is a map of where we are now. So this is Sukhothai and back, or this is Kambong Fet now, and back in the uh, Sukhothai Kingdom there were two cities. So here, sort of a um, hexagonal shape is Gambong Fet. It's on the east side of the Ping River. And on the west side was another city, Nakom Chum. And on my way to the museum, I stopped to look at this uh, chedi, the Wat Kalo Thai. So we've already visited that. And I think when I come back here, I'm gonna concentrate on this part of the historical park and visit these three temples and the moat. And what I find uh, quite interesting is here, when I was reading about the cultural heritage of Lopbury, this is where they say that hallmarks of the Lopbury culture include square towns surrounded by moats and embankments and large reservoirs holding water for consumption and cultivation. A religious sanctuary was often built in the center of the city. And that sounds, of course, very much like what you see at Angkor Wat, the square shape with a moat around the city. And that, of course, is what I keep noticing when I look at any maps of uh, Kampong Fet and on Google Maps, because you see the squarish shape of these cities, and then they have the rectangular moat system going around it. And uh, I guess that is part of the Lopburi tradition and connected with the Khmer kingdoms and what you see at Angkor Wat. So this museum is making me feel smart today. The museum is continuing to make me feel smart and I really appreciate that. And this entire room is dedicated to showing in a very clear and simple fashion, I find, um, the Buddhist art of uh, Sukhothai. And in each room, there's a single description on the wall telling you what your main takeaway from this uh, room should be. And they're talking about the different styles of the Buddha image that you find. And all of, um, all of these Buddha images are sitting in what they call the subduing Mara posture. I find the story of subduing Mara to be uh, quite interesting. I've heard, I've also heard it called sort of witnessing the earth posture. And the idea is that the Buddha was on his way to achieving enlightenment, but then the demon Mara came to tempt him with thoughts of earthly pleasures. And the Buddha summoned the spirit of the earth, the goddess of the earth to come and witness his struggle against the demon Mara, the demon Mara's temptations, and the earth goddess helped the Buddha by wringing her hair and unleashing a torrent of water which washed the uh, demon Mara away. At least that's one account that I read of that story recently. So when you see the Buddha sitting in that pose and he has one hand and several fingers pointing down 
and touching the ground, he's summoning the earth goddess to come help him uh, subdue Mara, the, uh, the demon trying to uh, tempt him. to the uh, second exhibition hall, which brings us more into more of a modern era, specifically the Ay Ayutthaya period. And I think this room focuses on the importance of Gambang Fet, the city, to the Ayutthaya kingdom, because this was considered a, and a very important outpost of the Ayutthaya kingdom. And um, yeah, they kind of laid it out for you right from the very beginning, which is why, again, I say this museum is making me feel smart because it tells me what I'm going to learn before I even go inside. And it's basically saying that this city, Gambang Fed, was important because of its position on the Ping River. So a lot of trade flowed through this city just because it was on the Ping River. And it was also important as a military defensive position against invading forces from Burma. So it was a strategic city. And uh, this last poster talks about how originally the city on the west side, Nakon Chum, was con probably considered more important, but then the importance shifted to Kambong Fet on the east side. And you can see that its importance as a military post because of all the you know the moats that surround the city the walls ramparts and forts that were all built of laterite so as you go around looking at the remains in this city i guess you can think about it from three points of view you know river trade sort of a strategic outpost against burma and then more of a military installation with all of the walls and defensive uh, positions I find this exhibit particularly interesting because I'm so interested in where this building material came from, the laterite. And there's a information sign here talking about how, you know, what laterite is made of. And it was actually underneath the ground. They would dig it up from the ground. And when it's in the ground, it's kind of moist and soft and porous, and they can cut it into different shapes. But when it's exposed to the air and dehydrates, then the laterite would turn into more of a stone-like material. I remember reading that once before at a museum in Myanmar, and then I forgot all about it. <laughs> so I've been reminded, and this museum has made me smarter again. But that kind of begs the question of where laterite comes from. They have laterite here, but why won't they have it in other countries? I don't know if we had laterite in Canada. Is there laterite in Indonesia, in the Philippines? I, I don't really know. And at the end of exhibition hall number two, you come to the most recent period, I guess, which is Tonbury. And it says at the very beginning, after the fall of Ayutthaya in 1767, the center was relocated from Ayutthaya to Bangkok and named Thonburi. But then we get some exhibits uh, talking about the importance of the city of uh, Kambong Fet during the, ba what they're calling, they're calling it the Bangkok period. So there it is there, Kambong Fet during Bangkok period, 1782 up until post 1932. And then we get familiar figures like King Taksin the Great here, who was involved heavily in this uh, part of uh, Gambang Fet's history. And the final exhibit in Exhibition Hall 2 is, is a suitable one because it 
is all about the visit of King Rama V to Gambang Fet, which uh, took place. And of course, this weekend is a long, is a holiday weekend in Thailand where they're celebrating the reign of King Rama V, who was sort of the, the modernizing monarch of uh, Thailand, of Siam. Yeah, he's a very beloved leader in the history of uh, Thailand. So here's the main uh, exhibit for that. Follow the footsteps of King Rama V on the private visit to Gambang Fet. And I guess it was uh, yeah, documented in uh, photographs. The royal, the royal boat sent his crew on a break for a meal during the royal visit to Gambang Fet. I guess that is his uh, boat there that he took up and down the Ping River. And they made a uh, replica of it here. Look at that. It's really beautiful. And here I believe they give the dates for when this took place. During his private visit to Kambang Fet between 18th to the 27th of August, 1906. So that was the, uh, the royal visit here. And as you go by this exhibit, now you find a hallway that connects to one of the new buildings and that should be exhibit, uh, exhibit hall number three. Moving down the passageway to the final exhibit hall, seem to have left the powerful air conditioning behind, but this is where they have the, uh, the bathrooms located. Very strategic, right in between exhibit halls one, two, and three. And I was just thinking, yeah, I could really use a bathroom. And uh, there it was, right there. But me being me, I can also use the occasional bench or chair to sit down and uh, get my bearings. But uh, so far, <laughs> no benches have made an appearance. So uh, I've been standing up this whole time. So yeah, I guess this final exhibit, oh, much smaller, I think, than the other ones. Maybe this uh, single room here and is dedicated to the uh, different ethnic groups of modern, modern Thailand. And this will be interesting. So I just recently visited a hill tribe market in between Tak City and Mesot, and I was doing some reading about all the various uh, tribal groups, and in particular about the styles of dress that identify uh, each group. Well, the main exhibits here are centering on the Mien people, or the Yao, and shows the traditional clothing as well as the traditional structure of their homes. And the Karen people. And they have some of the uh, clothing here on display. And on the other side, wow, black, the Hmong or Miao people. Very dramatic clothing style. And finally, the Lisu. To sum up, a visit to the National Museum in uh, Gambang Fet, highly recommended, highly recommended. I really enjoyed that visit. I enjoyed the exhibits, but I enjoyed even more the way it was organized. As I said, it's like every room was designed to help me feel better about myself and make me seem more intelligent than I actually am. So there you have it, the National Museum. Great way uh, to spend, uh, spend a morning when you first arrive in uh, Kampong Fet.